everyone. Welcome to, I think this is the last ever sext. I hope someone can pop on, but if not, no worries. Um, we've tried really hard in this whole year to be super flexible and hold things lightly. Hey, Tiffany Lushber. Um, to hold things lightly, to um, be able to turn on a dime and to do what's working and let go of what isn't working. To do what's the best use of everyone's energy and let go of what isn't. Um, so, you know, we change things up pretty frequently and that's just the way of it. So, hey, let me know how you're doing. Hey, Jana. Glad you guys are here with me. Um, okay, so he here's what I observe. Here's what I know. That, um, hey, Aspen. Pardon my, um, earmuffs. I'm gonna go for a run soon. I was outside and then I came back inside and I'm gonna go for a run. Um, the best metaphor that I can think of for how things are right now is the, the metaphor of a water table. So it's as though right now we are at a time when the water table of grief just under the surface of the ground is very high. And if we just ever so slightly dig or inadvertently poke a hole in the ground or um, you know, in the course of our work, dig a little deep, then all of this grief starts bubbling up. It's just right there under the surface. And I think that's true for us collectively and communally, um, given especially that we have passed the, um, we have passed the milestone of 300,000 people in the United States now dead of COVID. And I think yesterday, some 3,600 passed yesterday from this terrible pandemic. And I believe that our, um, our grief is largely unacknowledged and largely unexpressed. Um, I find myself uh, running and bumping into it all, all very frequently, so I, I I, I become, um, I feel ragey, like I was in a store this week and I felt ragey because so many people were going around with their masks hanging down underneath their nose. And I just felt this rage bubbling up. And in the car, I was like weeping and realizing that it's just, you know, this, this rage is grief. And this, you know, if we feel irritability, well, it's grief. If we feel, um, if we feel numbness, it's, it's grief wearing a different outfit. Um, but it's, it's still, it's grief. At least that's what I'm observing, observing in myself and in people close to me that we just, we have to allow ourselves these moment, these, the, it has to get out. And that is what lament is. Lament is not the internal processing of grief, Lament is the external outward expression of grief. And I came across, um, well, you guys know if you've been around for a while at Peace of Christ Church that I talk a lot under norm in normal times when we're all singing together regularly. Oh yeah, it was a numb day. Athens said she had a numb day. It was weird and confusing. Yeah, so um, whenever those are happening to me, I'm, I'm finding, and this may, may or may not be true for you, but I'm finding that, um, that it is a result of this huge well of collective grief that we're all just standing on top of right now. Um, so anyway, normally, under normal circumstances, I talk to you guys a lot about singing because we sing together. And so I try to remind us regularly of why we sing. And part of the reason 
that singing matters so much for human beings is because it allows us an opportunity ex to express things that would not otherwise be expressed. It would not otherwise have an outlet. Or sometimes things are, th like, like our emotions, the things that we need to express are too big for mere words. Um, they need more. They need more of an emotional outlet and they need more of an expression. And um, I think that's what music does for human beings. Part of it's part of why we find music in every human, um, every human culture that has ever been discovered has some form of rhythm making or vocalization or chanting, um, various forms of music. All humans make some kind of music. And I think that it's because of this, because we need to express these things. So this week, um, I guess it was maybe like a week ago. So, okay, I've never been like a huge TV watcher. Um, like Jordan and I will watch things together, but as far as like me just laying around and watching TV, that's never been like a huge part of what I do. I've always been a reader. But ever since the pandemic started, I've had, someone gave me a term for it. It's called reader's block. I have reader's block. Um, and I just, my attention span for reading is not that great right now. And it's okay. So, but I have been able to um, kind of like numb out and escape by watching TV. I realize it's a little bit strange for like a, a pastor to be talking about how it's okay to be sitting around and watching TV. But honestly, like whatever gets us through this time, like sometimes we need to, we need to escape from this reality because look, 3,000 people, 300,000 people uh, dead so far and 3,000 plus per day is a colossal amount of loss for us to process. And sometimes we need a break. So I've been watching The Crown. And it's very interesting. I resisted it for a while, but um, now it, it, it's quite fascinating. And um, in, in season three, there's an episode called Aberfan. And it depicts a true story of um, it depicts the true story of a terrible, terrible tragedy that happened in the 60s in Wales, in which, and this is, this is the part where I gave you, why I gave you the trigger, trigger warning on the, which I hope you saw, because I'm gonna talk about death a little bit. So if you need to pop off, you take care of yourself. Um, so in, it depicts this terrible tragedy that happened in which a coal mine collapsed down a mountain and fell into an elementary school. So like a hill full of um, like coal detritus, whatever it's called, the detritus of coal mining, uh, slid down the hill into an elementary school and killed a lot of kids and a lot of adults. But basically this town, this very small coal mining town in Wales was devastated by this terrible, terrible uh, tragedy and accident. And um, it was in part uh, the fault of the coal board of the time that wasn't enforcing the rules about some, some various safety rules. Um, and so a, a lot of people died, like 116 kids and some 30 adults. And this is a real thing that really happened and this episode depicts it. And uh, Prince Philip, who's played in the show by Tobias Menzies, goes and bears witness to the funeral that is held for all these people. It's like a, a large, uh, a large communal funeral. And Tobias Menzies gets home from that experience and he's having a conversation with, hey Tori, Trigger warning, grief and death. So just so you know, if you're, if you're not in a headspace for that, you can take care of yourself, love you. Um, so Tobias Menzies says, uh, he's, he's sort of debriefing with Queen Elizabeth once he gets home and he says, he says, I actually wrote the, wrote the dialogue down because it was so compelling. Oh, I forgot to say, during this funeral, this group of, you know, however many hundred people, they sing a hymn 
together at the funeral. And the hymn is Charles Wesley's Jesus Lover of My Soul to the tune that's called Aberystwyth, which is a Welsh melody. So, so he said, so uh, Prince Philip as played by Tobias Menzies says, he says, the grief, the anger, the rage in all the faces behind the eyes. They didn't smash things. They didn't smash things up or fight in the streets. And he pauses there. And then Elizabeth says, what did they do? And he says, they sang. The whole community. It was the most astonishing thing I've ever heard. He says, anyone who heard that hymn today would not just have wept, they would have been broken into a thousand pieces. And so what, what Prince Philip, this is a, it's a fictionalized account of a true story, uh, witnessed this funeral and these people expressing communal lament. They are, they are giving expression to communal lament and they're doing it by singing. So, I thought that I would play that song for you. Jesus, lover of my soul, to the tune of Aberystwyth, which Aberystwyth was written by Joseph Perry in 1876, and Charles Wesley wrote the lyrics in 1740. Here it is. I'm not gonna play it very well. I'm not a great pianist, so whatever. rebellious act to sing in the face of death, as Tori says in the comments here. It is holy resistance, but it is also holy expression. And, and I've been, I haven't been able to stop singing this song ever since I saw the, um, the scene. I haven't been able to stop singing this. I mean, the tune is obviously, it's so haunting and sorrowful. Um, but it gives expression to a lament that is deep, deep. And I think, you guys, if we don't lament this, we've lost 300,000 brothers and sisters and siblings. And if we don't lament this, it'll break us. We gotta lament it, and singing is one way we can do it. Um, I want us to be resilient, and I believe that lament is resilience. So that's what's on my mind today. Um, we won't have sex next week, but we are available for phone calls and emails and um, 
FaceTimes. If you guys need us, you can always send us a text or an email. Um, we're sending love. And um, I, I, don't, I don't ever apologize for lament. Like there's sort of a temptation to say, oh, sorry to be such a downer, you know, sorry to, but no, 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 we don't apologize for, for lament. We don't apologize for lament that is necessary and absolutely part of our humanity and part of um, how we stay strong and be strong in the face of loss. Okay? Um, I love you. Better days to come. Amen.